full screen here. There. All right, so starting off, um, I think everybody knows that this is a Canada goose. Um, we have lots of those around here at certain times of year. Um, the fields in, in Browse in particular are very popular uh, in the early spring and again in the fall. Uh, geese uh, eat a lot of grass, they do a lot of grazing and uh, they eat grass. The fields are getting a little bit dry now and they're not in the fields in Browse at the moment. Um, they certainly will come back a little later in the summer when, um, when things get a little damper in, you know, in September. So Canada geese. Uh, the, the most common duck that we have in this area is the mallard. Um, most people are familiar, I think, with mallards, nice green head that they have and, and yellow beak. This is the male and the female is, she doesn't wear such um, sporty looking clothes. Uh, females of all the duck species tend to be much more subdued in color. And there's a perfectly good reason for that, but I'll show you another couple of examples. Here's a pair of green wing teal. And again, the male on top, nice and brightly colored and the female uh, pretty pale and dull. I think the reason for, for the females being like that is reasonably obvious. They, they're the ones that sit on the eggs and a lot of ducks nest on the ground and they don't want to be conspicuous when they're sitting there for perhaps three weeks nonstop uh, incubating eggs. They'd just be a target for predators if they look like this male. So female ducks tend to be uh, quite dull in color and they blend nicely with, uh, with the surroundings when they're sitting on their eggs. Now, not all ducks nest on the ground. We have several species of ducks around here. This, this is one example. This is a Barrow's golden eye. And there are quite a few species of ducks that actually nest in trees. They nest in, in cavities in trees, old woodpecker holes, or sometimes in natural cavities if they can find them. So this Barrow's golden eye is one of the ducks that does nest in trees. Bufflehead do, and some of the Magansers do. And speaking of Magansers, here's a male and female common Maganser. I have one more picture of the Maganser because he's a pretty interesting looking duck. He's got a lovely green head when the light hits it just, just correctly. And if you look really closely at that bill, you can see the little tiny serrations on the edge of the bill. This duck is primarily a fish eater and, and having those serrations on the edge of this bill make it a lot easier for him to grab onto slippery little fish when he's uh, chasing them underwater. Uh, grouse, we have three species of grouse in the valley here. Um, ruffed grouse, which is this one in the picture, is by far the most common, particularly in the valley bottoms. As you go up slope a little bit, uh, you run into uh, spruce grouse, but they've all, I've never seen a spruce grouse in the valley bottom uh, around here. They always stay up high. And we also have dusky grouse in the valley. Um, they're, they're pretty tolerant of any elevation. I have seen broods of dusky grouse in the valley bottom, and I've seen broods of dusky grouse in subalpine meadows. And, and everywhere in between. So they're, they, they're not so fussy about elevation, whereas spruce grouse, strictly uh, an upper elevation or mid elevation at least bird. And this rough grouse prefers the lower elevations. And it's the one that you're going to see almost exclusively. If you see, you know, if you see a grouse on the side of the road when you're driving along, it's almost certainly gonna be the rough grouse. This is the one that you hear sometimes in the spring too, that, that, that makes that um, noise with his wings sound, sometimes it sounds a bit like an engine just trying to get started. And it's just, it's just air expelling from, from their wings. I, I expect most of you have, have heard that at one point or another. These uh, collared doves are a bit of an interesting story. Um, up until 10 years ago, we didn't have any. Uh, in fact, most of British Columbia didn't have any 15 or 20 years ago, and they went through a, a really, really rapid population explosion in the last decade or two. And they're really common now in, in almost all 
towns and farming areas and, and you know generally places where people live they, they don't seem to like the the open the uh, closed forests and the wilderness they're not a wilderness bird by any means but uh, they have just gone through this immense population explosion in the last few years the very first one in the cusp was, was 2010 so that was 11 years ago now and now we have them pretty much all over in the cusp. Uh, we get them in Browse, uh, Crescent Bay, and I've seen them in Edgewood and Burton, and they're, they're pretty much spread all over the place now. Quite a remarkable story, really, considering that 10 years ago we had none in the valley. This little guy should be back any day now. I keep expecting to see one, and, and I haven't. Um, Rufus hummingbird. We have, we have three species of humming. Well, actually, we have four species of hummingbird in British Columbia, but three that you can reasonably expect to see in the Kootenays. This Rufus hummingbird is by far the most common. Uh, we also have a calliope hummingbird and a black chinned hummingbird that are less common, but they are seen. Uh, it, it, the, the calliope is kind of hit and miss. Uh, like I know they have them in New Denver, but they're pretty scarce in the cusp. Uh, they have them in Edgewood. Um, I don't know, but I know there's a couple of people listening in from Revelstoke and perhaps at the very end, you can let me know if you have calliope hummingbirds in Revelstoke, if you know. And the black chinned hummingbird is the third one. And that's not very common either. Although it is in Creston and, and Castlegar and Trail, they have quite a lot of black chins down there. Not so much up where we are. The Rufus hummingbird male, this, this picture is a male with all of the red color over most of his body. Uh, the female is green on the back and primarily white underneath with a little bit of buff in the, in the sides. So they look very, very different, the male and female hummingbird. Some people think that we actually have two kinds of hummingbirds, that we've got the brown ones and the green ones, but actually the green ones are just the females. This is another bird that uh, is fairly often seen. It's not shy by any means. This is a killdeer. This is in the plover family. And if you've encountered killdeer, they're, they're quite noisy and they have a, a pretty impressive distraction display that they use to try and lure you away from either their eggs or their young if they've hatched. And, and they go into a pretty good broken wing act and they flop around pathetically on the ground and, and, and trail wings out and, um, and look quite injured. And, and an injured bird is, um, any predator will just lash onto an injured bird. They're, they're a lot easier to catch than the, than the healthy ones. So that's the idea. The killdeer thinks if he looks injured and he looks hurt, that uh, you will go to him rather than continue to look for his young. The display gets pretty fancy, but it, it looks something like this. They, they go down on the ground and they, they display that orange color in their tail, which is highly visible. This bird still got his wings tucked in, but the next stage after this would be to flap their wings out on the ground and just flutter around a little bit and look pathetic. And it usually works. And it's uh, it, once the killdeer does that and starts trying to lead you away, it's very, very difficult to find the nest or whatever is he's leading you away from. They're, they're really good at it. And th this is what he's trying to lead you away from. Uh, killdeer nest right on the ground. Uh, they make very little effort to make a nest. You can see that this this killdeer has put a few stems and things around his nest to kind of frame it in a little bit, but there is no nest itself. It's just a little bit of a depression in the ground. And and they'll nest in, in the wildest places. Uh, this is a little, little bit of vegetation here, but I've seen killdeer nests in gravel parking lots. I've seen them in people's vegetable gardens in the, in the bare dirt. Uh, they They just like really wide open places. Unfortunately, at this time of year, with the Arrow Lake being as low as it is, there's lots of exposed sand and gravel on the lake, and that's just prime nesting habitat for them. Unfortunately, if, if they nest too close to the water line, um, the water's going to start coming up pretty soon, and some of them do get flooded out. 
This, uh, this is a Wilson snipe, another member of that, what we call shorebirds, which includes the sandpipers, plovers, things of that sort. The snipe is a, a ground nesting bird as well, uh, pretty common in places like Browse, uh, Crescent Bay, the, the, the fields in Edgewood. They like grassy fields and they like marshy areas and they nest on the ground, usually in tall grass, often in damp places. But in the springtime, they haven't quite started yet, but any time now, they will start hopping up onto fence posts like this, or the males will. The females will be uh, not as flashy, but the males will, will pop up and start making a noise and calling and attracting, trying to attract females and defending their territory from other males. But as soon as that's finished, as soon as all that territorial stuff is over, they go back down into the grass and they can be actually very hard to find. And with all of that um, gray and black and white streaking on the back, once they're in the grasses, um, they're pretty well camouflaged. We don't have a lot of gulls uh, in the valley at this time of year, but those of you who live on the Arrow Lake will know that we get lots and lots of them in September in particular, uh, when the kokanee are spawning. Uh, there can be as many as a thousand at the mouth of the creek in Burton, um, a smaller number at the mouth of the creek in the cusp, and some of the smaller creeks like McDonald Creek will have some as well. Any place where the kokanee are spawning, the gulls will gather because as soon as the kokanee die and start floating down the stream again, there's uh, it's a smorgasbord. There's just it's a banquet, and uh, the gulls will come from far and wide to to share in that feast. If you're familiar with the situation of Burton in September, you will see lots of other fish eating birds there too. Lots of eagles, uh, herons, loons, things of that sort all gather at the mouth of the creek in Burton, particularly in September. There are lots of different kinds of gulls and lots of them look just like this one. Uh, gray backs, white underneath, some red on the bill and black wingtips that you can see sticking out behind this bird. Lots of them have that particular pattern and separating them can be tricky. Sometimes you get a little bit of a help because some of them have yellow legs like this California gull and some of them have pink legs so that helps a little bit. Uh, this bird has a dark eye, some of them have a, a yellowish colored eye and that can help separate them a little bit. But separating gulls is, is pretty tricky. Most of the gulls that we get uh, in this valley, in the Arrow Lakes Valley in the fall are this species, California gull. I'd say 90% of them are California gulls. Most of the rest are herring gulls, which is one of the pink legged ones. And then what's always interesting is trying to sort through the, the 500 to 1000 gulls looking for the odd, odd one in the mix, which can take a while, but uh, you never know what you're gonna find. There are five or six other species that over the years we've seen here, one or two now and again. And there's the loon that I mentioned a few minutes ago, common loon. Uh, we do see common loons on Arrow Lake at this time of year and again in the fall, as I mentioned, when the kokanee are spawning, but they don't nest on Arrow Lake. Um, the water level is too variable. They, they need a stable water level because they nest right at the water's edge. And if the water comes up more than 10, 15 centimeters, that would be enough to, to flood their nest if they don't have a, a reasonably stable water level. They do breed on Box Lake and Summit Lake and most of the other small lakes uh, in, this, in the valley, but not on Arrow Lake. One of the reasons that loons nest so close to the edge is that um, they are, they're built for, for swimming and diving. And if you think for a moment about where, where do you put the propeller on, on a boat, you put it right at the very back of the boat and loons have their legs well back in their body, much further back on their body than any other bird, which means that their feet, when the, which is their main means of propulsion underwater, their feet are right at the back. And that's great when you're diving underwater and paddling, chasing fish, but it's not so good when you want to stand up. And in fact, a loon cannot stand up. 
which is why they build their nest so close to the edge, because all they can do is kind of thrust forward and belly flop out of the lake and onto their nest. And if something startles them when they're on their nest, they just kind of flop back into the water. They, they cannot stand up and walk on dry land. Turkey vultures, uh, lots of those around these days. That wasn't always the case. Their expansion hasn't been quite as dramatic as the collared dove that I mentioned a few minutes ago, but it certainly has, they certainly have expanded their range tremendously in the last, say, 30, 40 years. Uh, when I first came to Nacusp in the 70s, there were no turkey vultures here at all. And it was the early 80s when, when we saw the very first one. But now uh, they're pretty much over at least the southern third, maybe even the southern half of BC um, quite regularly. And in, in places like Browse, and again, the big fields in Edgewood, they, they like open areas like, like Browse and Edgewood. And it would be nothing to see eight or 10 of them circling around over the fields um, in the early, late spring, early summer. Bald eagle, mostly people are mostly familiar with the bald eagle. It's the, by far, the most common of the two eagle species here. In fact, golden eagles are, are rare here. Um, the, the adult bald eagle like this one is pretty easy to identify, but bald eagles don't get that white head and white tail till they're at least four years old. So for the first four years of their life, they don't look like this. They look more like this, and this is this is the plumage that makes a lot of people think they're seeing golden eagles. I, I get quite a lot of reports of people saying they've seen golden eagles at Burton and and so on, and it's it, it's very very unlikely that anybody's ever seen a golden eagle catching fish at Burton. Uh, they just don't do that. They don't catch fish. We do have some golden eagles in the valley in the summertime, but they're in the alpine. They like open country. Golden eagles are open country birds. You drive across the prairies, you'll see lots of golden eagles. Um, you go to the Okanagan even, uh, where there are some grasslands or, or Kamloops or places like that, you will see golden eagles. But in, in the West Kootenays, uh, at least most of the West Kootenays that's covered in heavy coniferous forest, you, you are not going to see golden eagles except in the alpine country or the odd straggler that sometimes shows up in the valley bottom. Um, and as a matter of fact, I saw one last week in Edgewood. It, it was a young bird. It was an immature golden eagle. But uh, it, it surprised me to see it uh, in the valley bottom at all. So you have to be pretty careful trying to identify golden eagles. Of the large hawks, the red-tailed hawk is pretty much our only regularly occurring large hawk, uh, the only one that breeds in the valley. Sometimes in migration or early winter, we may get some of the others passing through, but the red-tailed hawk is resident um, and does breed in the valley. We have a few species of owls in, in the valley bottom, but uh, owls aren't very visible. Uh, they're primarily nocturnal, or at least most species are, not all species, but most species are nocturnal. Uh, they prefer the nighttime. Obviously, this barred owl is out in the daytime, and obviously this picture was not taken recently. Uh, sometime, it wasn't even this past winter, it was the winter before. So once in a while they do come out in the daytime, they have to eat and uh, when they're hungry enough, they'll come out when they have to. Barred owl is probably one of, well, one of the two most common owls that we have in the valley bottom. The barred owl and the saw wet owl are our two common breeding owls and a little bit higher up the slopes, uh, we get pygmy owls breeding. Pygmy owl is tiny, as the name suggests. This, this bird is probably no bigger than a robin. It's a bit fatter and chubbier than a robin, but in terms of overall length from head to end of tail, he's no bigger than a robin. 
Uh, pygmy owls do come down to the valley bottom in the winter time. And at this time of year, they've gone back up slope a little bit and they'll be breeding in the, in the forests um, halfway up the mountains in the valley. We have oh, half a dozen species of woodpecker uh, in this area. This is probably the most common, the northern flicker. This is the one that you will often hear right at this time of year, uh, rattling on, on your chimney or on the street lights or on a dead tree or something that makes a lot of noise, just, just making that, brrr, that loud drumming noise. And the more noise he can make, the better. He's not feeding, he's not trying to make a hole, he's not looking for food when he does that. He's just simply trying to make a noise to declare his territory, make sure females know he's there, make sure other males know that the territory is already occupied. And he'll continue to do that for another probably month um, as, as they go through the breeding season and, and continue to maintain territorial boundaries. And the largest of our woodpeckers, the pileated woodpecker is also a pretty common bird uh, in this area. The next little group, that, that first group of birds that we've seen up to now uh, are a subclass of birds called non-passerine birds. Um, basically non-perching birds, non-singing birds. And, and the second half, um, the, the passerines, the ones that can sing to some extent, although some can sing a lot better than others, um, sort of came about much later in, in geological time. It was, it was the non-passerines that, uh, that developed first on earth. And, and these smaller woodland birds, usually smaller, uh, came along much later. This is a willow flycatcher. There are five or six flycatchers that look just like that bird there, sort of an olive gray green back, a little paler on the front, a couple of good wing bars, and identifying flycatchers is really, really difficult. Uh, helpful if you know what sounds they make, because that is sometimes the only way you can separate one flycatcher from another is by their voice which works pretty well in, in May and June and early July when they're still singing and, and defending territory. But uh, once they turn silent uh, later in the summer, it's very difficult. And my notes include lots of uh, notations that just say flycatcher because once they stop singing, it's very difficult to separate them. Some flycatchers are a little different. This is an Eastern kingbird and he is in the flycatcher family. He's about twice as big as that willow flycatcher that we just looked at. Uh, this bird is probably a little bit bigger than a robin. Reasonably, reasonably common. Uh, again, prefers open country. Um, I would see them in Browse and again in Edgewood and any place where there's open, open country like that. They're, they're, you will not see them in the closed forest. Another little group of birds called the, the, the vireos, uh, insect eating birds, like a, a lot of the small uh, forest birds are insect eaters. This, is, this particular bird is a red-eyed vireo for obvious reasons. Uh, we have three species here, the red-eyed vireo, the Cassin's vireo, and the warbling vireo, all reasonably common. Not quite back yet. Um, Red-eyed vireo is one of those birds that comes back a little later. I wouldn't really expect to see one until pretty much late May, end of May. The Cassin's vireo comes back first and I actually haven't heard one yet, but I would expect them to be back any day now. And then the warbling vireo will come back in the next couple of weeks. Um, this picture, not, not the, the world's best picture, but I put it in here for a reason. This is the American crow, and I put it in because I, I'm often asked uh, if there's a quick and easy way to tell a raven from a crow. 
Well, in flight, particularly when the bird is gliding, uh, it, it is pretty easy. Uh, if you look at this bird's tail, now, except for the fact that a couple of his feathers are a little bit longer than the others, and that probably means that he's in the process of molting his tail feathers. But other than that, the, the, the end of the tail is pretty much squared off. It, it's pretty much a straight line across the back of the tail. And that's typical of crows. If you try and keep that image of the tail in your mind for a second, when I go to the next picture and have a look at the shape of the tail of a raven. See, it's very different a big wedge-shaped tail. The central tail feathers are a lot longer than the outer tail feathers as compared to the crow, if I go back just for a second, uh, where pretty much all the tail feathers are the same length, more or less. So if a bird is in flight, that's the easiest way to separate them. Swallows. We have six species of swallows in the valley. Um, two of them like to nest in cavities, old woodpecker holes, or maybe that box that you put up on your fence. Um, two of them like to nest in, in burrows or in cliffs and things like that. And the other two make nests out of mud. So we've got six species and uh, three pairs that all have slightly different nesting requirements. This one is a tree swallow. This one will take your nest box. If you put a box on a fence post, uh, this will be the most likely bird to take it. Tree swallows have this general bluish color on their back when the sun hits it. If it's not in good light, it just looks black. But when, when the light shines on it, it's a definite blue. The other one of the cavity nesting birds is the violet green swallow and it has a sort of a greenish cast to its back, again, once the, once the light hits it. Now, this is one of the two mud building nests. This is a barn swallow, and it's the only swallow that we have with a nice long pointed tail feathers. There are, in other parts of the world, there are quite a lot of swallows with tails like this, but we only have the one, the barn swallow. So this is one of the mud building nests. And the northern rough-winged swallow is one of the ones that likes to nest in rock crevices or burrows. And recently, um, these huge, gigantic concrete Lego blocks that they've been using for retaining walls around the place, uh, they seem to like that. Where these three blocks come together, there's a little triangular hole there. And they've been using those as nest sites now. This picture was taken, for those of you who live in the cusp, this picture was taken at the wall just beside the, the doctor's office on Broadway. And that little parking lot that they built behind the, or to off the end of the doctor's office, that wall has got at least two pair nesting in it every year for the last couple of years. Chickadees, most of us are familiar with chickadees because you put the bird feeder will be the first one that comes, probably, uh, particularly if you put sunflower seeds in your feeder. Uh, we have four kinds of chickadees in the valley. Uh, this is by far the most common one, the black capped chickadee. We also have the chestnut back chickadee, which looks very similar to this, except the gray and the black that you see on this bird would be a rich chestnut brown color on the chestnut back chickadees. And then if you go up slope, up into the mountains, we have mountain chickadee and boreal chickadee, which uh, generally speaking, well, the boreal chickadee never comes to valley bottom. The mountain chickadee occasionally comes to valley bottom in the winter, but usually not, they stay up high. The other really common uh, bird feeder bird is the red-breasted nuthatch. You can see he's, uh, he's selected his sunflower seeds and he, he's going to take it away. Both the chickadee and the nuthatch uh, will not uh, eat their seeds right on your feeder. They all take them away and, and break them open somewhere else. Uh, the chickadee will, will find a little branch and will hold the seed in his feet and then pound away at it with his beak to open it up. The nuthatch has a completely different approach. This bird will go to a tree 
a tree trunk usually and find a crevice in the bark to wedge the seed in. And then once the seed is, is secured in a little crack, then he'll pound at it with his beak and, and open it up. But they always take their seed away from the feeder and, and eat it somewhere else. American Dipper. Uh, I'm sure lots of people have seen these guys in, in, the, in the fast moving rivers. That's, that's where they live. Um, they stand on rocks like this and then just dive in the water and disappear. Uh, they're after insect larvae or small fish or whatever they can find in the water. Doesn't seem to matter how fast the creek is. Doesn't seem to matter how cold the water is. Uh, they just dive right in there and, and, and find food. Mountain bluebirds are pretty spectacular looking birds. Uh, we have them in migration. They don't very often stay to breed here. I'm not sure why. We, we certainly have habitat for them. They like open fields and open country. Um, some years ago, we did put up lots and lots of nest boxes for them and had very limited success in attracting them. Um, maybe half a dozen nests in 30 years, something like that. Not very often do they stay here. And, and, I, and I don't know why, there's, there's really no reason for it. There's lots of them that breed in the Okanagan, lots of breed in Castlegar Trail, uh, Creston, uh, all over the place. But for some reason, they just don't seem to want to stay around here. Well, at least not very often. Bluebirds are related to the thrushes. This is uh, another one of the thrushes. This is a Swainson's thrush, probably our most common um, thrush. Well, not quite. I'll tell you the most common one in just a second. Uh, but this is a, a pretty common bird and uh, not very flashy. You don't see it out in the open very often, but if you know its song, uh, you, you will hear it a lot in, in the woods and in the forest. This, uh, the American Robin, is also a thrush, and, and clearly it's our most common thrush. Uh, at this time of year, when, when migration is underway, uh, we can get, oh, flocks of 100 or more, particularly when the fields were wet in Browse a week or so ago. Fields have all dried out now, and uh, the, the, the worms aren't on the surface like they were, but it, was, it would have been nothing to drive through Browse a week or 10 days ago and, and see, you know, 50 or 75 in this field and you drive to the next field and there's another 50 there and you go to the next field and there's 50 more. They were just all over the place in the, in the fields when they were nice and wet. And the other thrush that we see fairly commonly is the varied thrush. Uh, th this is much more secretive than the robin, very, very similar looking to the robin, uh, except for that black mark across his breast but quite secretive. Um, they don't come out in the open nearly as often as, as do the robins. This is a cedar waxwing. There are two kinds of waxwings, uh, cedar waxwings and bohemian waxwings. We have cedar waxwings in the summer and bohemian waxwings in the winter. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we only ever have Bohemians in the winter. There's no exception to that. They go back up north to breed. Cedar waxwings are primarily here in the summer, although occasionally one or two do stay for the winter, but that's, that's unusual. Waxwings are so called because of those little, little red tips to their feathers on their wings. It, it, to somebody, to some early early ornithologist, it just looked like those feathers had been dipped in red wax. And there's a little bit of daub of red wax on the end of their wing feathers, hence the name wax wing. It's the only bird we have with a yellow fringe around the end of its tail. So if you see that, it's uh, guaranteed to be a cedar wax wing or a bohemian, they have the same yellow. Warblers, we have probably 
ten species of warbler in this area. Uh, many, many more than that in the east. Warblers are primarily deciduous forest birds. There are a couple of exceptions, but most of the warblers are deciduous forest birds, uh, which is why the east has so many more because they have the huge expanse of deciduous forest. Almost all of our forests in British Columbia are coniferous forests. And most of the warblers don't like coniferous forests. As I said, there are a couple of exceptions, but most of them not. This, this particular bird in the picture now is an American red start, a male, pretty stunning looking bird, uh, black and orange, uh, unmistakable when you see them. The yellow warbler is perhaps our, our most common uh, particularly in damper riparian areas, um, lots and lots of them at the south end of Summit Lake in the marsh or along the edges of the marsh there. They're not really marsh birds, but they like that riparian uh, second growth that grows around the edges of wet areas. Uh, they're also reasonably common in browse around the edges of the fields. And you sometimes see them in town and back gardens and things like that. Pretty common warbler in this area. They're not back yet either. Uh, warblers are all the warblers are insectivorous. They um, they feed on insects on the leaves on trees. And since most of our trees don't have leaves yet, our deciduous trees, uh, it's not quite time for the warblers to come back. They will come back sometime in May. All of them. The one that does come back early and the one that does tolerate coniferous forest is this yellow rumped warbler. You can only see half of him, but uh, you can see that he is in the coniferous tree. He's a pretty flashy looking bird. You can nice little yellow crown, yellow in the throat, yellow in the wings. And as the name suggests, uh, you can't see it in this picture, but he has a yellow rump there at the base of the tail on, on the, at the, at the back, on the back of the bird near the base of the tail. There's a yellow patch as bright as the yellow that you can see in this picture. This one and the yellow warbler, I would say, are the two most common warblers in our area. And this one, the yellow rump, does come back early. They're back already, um, as I say, because they don't mind feeding in, in coniferous trees, and we certainly have an abundance of those. Sparrows uh, can be a bit problematic when it comes to identification. Uh, this particular one is a chipping sparrow, pretty common. Uh, again, they're not quite back yet, but um, a, a lot of the, of the birds come back in May. Some come back in April, but May is, is when the, the real action starts. Um, if, if you do encounter a sparrow and it's your goal to try and identify it, you can take out your field guide and look it up. The, the very first thing you must notice about a sparrow is, is the breast plain, such as this bird, or is it streaked? Uh, and that kind of divides your sparrows in half right away. And that makes the rest of your job a little bit easier. And once you've decided whether it's a streak breasted one or a plain breasted one, the next thing to look at is the pattern on the head. And usually those two features will lead you to an identification most of the time, but, you know, as long as you get a decent look. So a chipping sparrow is plain breasted and has that little rufous cap on top of his head. Now here's an example of a streak breasted sparrow. This is a savanna sparrow. Savanna sparrows are, are primarily grassland birds. Uh, they don't all have such a bright yellow mark on their face, but they all have a, a, a hint of yellow at the very least. Sometimes it just looks a little bit creamy and sometimes it's bright yellow like this. It's, it's quite a variable feature. But once you've determined that you're looking at a streak breasted sparrow, and then if you look at the head pattern and look for any hint of, of yellow or creamy colored at least, then that should uh, get you to where you're going and identify it as a savanna sparrow. Most often seen in, again, in, in the fields, uh, Browse, Edgewood, Crescent Bay, areas like that. This is probably our most common sparrow, the song sparrow. And what separates it from most of our other sparrows is the fact that it's here year round. 
they, uh, they you, you could see them at any time of year. They're a little bit shy, particularly in the winter. They will spend a lot of the winter in, in hedgerows or thickets like that. Uh, they tend to try and stay out of sight. Now, in this time of year, when the males start singing and declaring territory, they pop up to conspicuous perches uh, so that they can sing and, and make, make sure they're heard by their competitors and by the females. But the song sparrow is definitely our most common sparrow. Another one of the streak breasted ones and the head pattern is this alternating brown and gray stripe pattern. Uh, white crowned sparrows. Again, a distinctive head pattern and a clear breast on this particular one. White crowned sparrows can be numerous here in migration. I've only seen one or two so far, but I'm kind of expecting them to show up any day now. And sometimes, not every year, but sometimes they're here in big flocks. Uh, I have had as many as 75 in my yard at one time because I do put seed out on the ground, uh, which is where sparrows prefer to feed is on the ground. But other years, um, I, I just get four or five. And other years, as I say, 75 or more. It just, it just depends. The one in the, in the front left that looks a little different than the others uh, is a young bird. It's a juvenile bird. Hasn't developed the full black and white stripes on his head yet. This is also a member of the sparrow family. It's a, a dark-eyed junco. Juncos can be numerous as well, particularly in migration. Uh, a few of them stay around in the winter. Sometimes I have a few uh, at my feeders in the winter time. Uh, other years, not. But pretty common. Um, fairly easy to identify, especially the males with that solid black head. Okay, the last little group here. Um, this is this bird is a bobolink, which is in the blackbird family. Uh, these bobolinks are uh, some bobolinks are kind of hard to find uh, in some places. We do have a small population of them, of them in Browse, and again in Edgewood. I keep talking about Browse and Edgewood. They're two of the best birding areas around here. They nest in hay fields which is um, not the wisest thing to do sometimes because hay fields get cut and quite often they get cut before the eggs have developed properly or at least before the young have been able to fledge. A lot depends on the weather in June. Uh, I always love it when it rains a lot at the end of June because that's when the haying would start if the hay was, if the grass was dry. But if the grass stays wet until mid-July, then that's long enough for the bobolinks to raise their young and get them off the nest. But it's, you know, it's pretty much a 50-50 thing around here. Uh, it's probably why there are not more bobolink areas in the province, but there's probably no more than a dozen places in the province where they where they breed. And those are probably places where the haying uh, can be delayed some years because of weather. In the Okanagan, I'm quite sure there'd be no chance of bobolinks um, making a go of it. There are a small number of bobolinks in one location in the South Okanagan where, where a field has actually been preserved for them. It's actually called bobolink meadows in the South Okanagan near Asuyas. So there's that one place where there is no haying done, or at least not um, during the breeding season. But there are probably six to eight pairs that breed in browse every year, and probably twice that many that breed in the fields in Edgewood, in the inner Oakland Valley. Other than that, you'd have to go to Grand Forks. There's, um, there are some breeding areas in Grand Forks. There are some at Creston. Um, 
can't think of another one right now. There, there are not very many places in BC where they, where they breed regularly. This is a fairly common um, blackbird. This is the Brewer's blackbird. This is a male with a nice shiny blackish blue uh, feathers and the very pale eye. Once again, browse, <laughs> lots of them in browse, lots of them in, in Edgewood. They like open areas as well. And the last picture we're is the birds today. Uh, this is a lazuli bunting, pretty spectacular looking bird. Um, bright blue head and back and that little orange streak across his breast and the white belly. Um, this is one of the seed eating birds. You can tell he's a seed eater because he's got a heavy bill, uh, a sort of a triangular shaped, conical shaped bill. And the seed eaters all have that heavier bill for, for cracking open seeds. The, the buntings like to breed in young trees, young growth shrubs and, and, and young deciduous trees. Uh, until those of you who live in the area will, will probably have noticed that last year the Yellowstone Road and Bridge, the highways crew, went around Browse and cleared all the ditches and just cut down all of the trees and shrubs and things that were growing around the edges of the field and in the ditches. This is where the, the buntings have been nesting. And there would be at least 12 or 15 pairs scattered around Browse Loop but most of them would have been around that edge, which is mostly gone now. Uh, so for the next year or two, I suspect we'll have fewer buntings than, uh, than we have had for the last few years. Those trees are gonna grow up again. Those shrubs will grow back fairly quickly, but we could, we could see a reduction in buntings uh, for the next little while. So that's the last of my pictures. Um, if there are, are people that wish to ask questions? I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So if anybody's got a question, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask Gary. Yeah, Loretta. Does a barn owl have feathers on their feet? A barn, does a barn owl have feathers on its feet? Not that I recall, but I have my book right here. I'm just gonna look for you, but I don't think so. Is, is there many birds that do? They're usually non-feathered feet, right? Uh, usually, yes. Um, some of the grouse and ptarmigan have feathered legs. There, there is one hawk called a rough-legged hawk, and, and his legs aren't really rough, but there are feathers on his legs, which makes him, which gives him his name. Okay, I've got a picture of a barn owl here, and he does not, he has feathers part way down his legs to that okay. joint. He has feathers down to that joint, but not the last part of his leg, so oh, okay. partially feathered. Okay, it must be that they sit with them pulled up quite close to their body because someone said mentioned. So, okay, thank you, Gary. Yeah, barn Gary owls, barn owls uh, we don't have barn owls around here. Um, there's been one or two records from the Castlegar area, uh, one or two records from Creston, but um, generally we there's too much snow in the Kootenays for, for barn owls. I have another question. Yes. Um, in Germany, years ago, they say, don't feed the birds over the summer. What are you thinking? And, and now they say, last years I hear, you can feed the birds all year round. What are you, are you thinking? Well, there are differences of opinion on that. Uh, personally, I don't feed the birds in the summertime, no. except, except for the hummingbirds. I do, I do have yeah. hummingbird feeders, but I don't feed them in the summer. Um, there's, there's plenty of them to eat in the summertime. They don't need our help in the summer. Um, but I know, yeah, some people do. I, I know some people that do keep their feeders out all year long. 
it's a bit of a problem here as well because um, we sometimes get bears, for example, and bears will eat sunflower seeds. <laughs> so, uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, it, the last few years in particular, uh, traditionally, I used to put my feeders up in about mid-September, late September, but I can't do that anymore. I have to wait until the bears have gone to sleep. So I don't even feed in September and October anymore. Okay, thank you. Pam, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a question. I just wanted to say, I know that we do get um, calliope hummingbirds here. I've seen them up on Mount Revelstoke near the ski chalet, if you know where that is. Yes, I do. And, yes. Yeah, fortunately, I was with a bird watcher at the time, John Woods. Who you oh, might I know, know. I know John very well, yes. Yes, yes. He's moved to um, Salmon Arm. Salmon Arm. Now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question was about magpies. What's the range of for magpies now? <laughs> magpies have a, an odd sort of distribution. Uh, you've got them up in Revelstoke, don't you? I, I'm not sure. I've never seen one, but I've seen them down closer to Vernon. The, the, they're definitely common in the in the Okanagan. There's no question about that. Lots of them in the Okanagan. Um, there are scattered populations in the Kootenays. There's there's definitely a population around Creston. Uh, I have seen them driving the Trans Canada Highway, you know, east from Salmon Arm through Revelstoke and even past Revelstoke. I've seen them on the highway there. Uh, which which seems like a really strange place because that's mostly coniferous forest there, which is not traditionally their habitat. But I have seen them there. But Nakasp, I think in 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 the forty five years I've lived here, I I may have seen six, um, and you see them once and you never see them again. They, they don't stay here. They're just odd wanderers passing through. So the the, the range is is a little bit hard to explain. Uh, they. Theoretically, they could be anywhere in the southern third of the province, but but they're not. They're just here and there. I, I would say that more likely they tend to be in the open country than in the, than the closed forest. But there are places where I've seen them in the forest as well. So I'm not sure. It's it's a bit hard to explain that one. Yes, thank you. Gary, if people wanted to um, provide water for birds, what's the best way to do that in their garden? Sorry, provide what for birds? For a wa water for them to drink? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Certainly water will attract them, particularly um, when summer comes. Uh, it needs to be, it, it, ideally you, you've, want to be able to provide water of varying depths. Um, so there's, you know, there's different ways to do that. You can either have two or three different uh, depths of, of bowls or dishes or something, uh, or you can have a fairly big one and put a couple of rocks in it so that it makes it shallower here and there. Uh, sometimes they'll just want to land on the, on the rock and, and have a drink. Sometimes they'll want to get in there and have a bath. Uh, they'll use the water for both purposes. Uh, but it, it certainly will attract them. You, you've got to be a little bit careful that you're not setting them up for predators. So, you know, don't, don't put your water right next to a bush or something where something can lurk in there and hide. Uh, I, I've got a, a pond in my backyard with a little bit of a stream. So b by creating a stream where the water flows down, it's easy for me to make lots of different depths. You know, there are places where it's just a centimeter deep, but it comes over the gravel and then there's little ponds here and there. So, um, but they, they like it. They, at certain times of year, um, there's, there's lots of birds in there. When it gets warmer, they seem to like to come in in the late afternoon. I, I thought at first when I, when I built this pond and, and uh, wanted to keep it open year round, I thought that they would come in the winter time when, the, when water was hard to come by. But they don't. They almost never come in the winter. Um, lots of birds will just simply eat snow in the winter. I've, I've seen chickadees, I've seen woodpeckers just eating snow. Uh, I guess that's where they get most of their water from in the wintertime. Hi Gary, thank you for the great presentation. Um, 
where, what book would you recommend for identifying birds in the Revelstoke, BC area? Um, I'd say there are two. There's, um, there's the National Geographic uh, series of field guides, and there's the Sibley series of field guides. I happen to have, oh, can't, can you, that's a little hard to see, isn't it? Um, the Sibley guide is very popular with a lot of people, and others seem to prefer the National Geographic. Both Sibley and National Geographic have split their field guide into an Eastern version and a Western version. The advantage of getting the Western version is that it's about half the size physically. You, you can't, perhaps you can't tell how big this is, but if I put it right beside my head, you can't. It's right. a fairly big book. And this is the Sibley guide that covers all of North America. The Sibley guide to the West is, as I say, about half that size physically and it's much easier to carry. And similarly, the National Geographic guides uh, have done exactly the same thing. There is one that covers all of North America, and they also have come up with an Eastern and a Western one, which again is physically smaller and much easier to deal with. I, I don't think either one of them is, is, is head and shoulders better than the other. They're both very good, and you, you, you'd be fine with either one. I would recommend the Western one though, um, for the reason that I mentioned, it's smaller, but also because there's fewer birds to wade through when you're trying to identify something. Right. You Thank you so you much. To, you don't have to wade through all those eastern ones, which aren't going to be here anyway. I just wanted to let people know who are in the cusp and have a, a the cusp library card that we have bird identification guides here. We're going to be getting some field guides. We have Gary's um, list as well, which is perfect for areas, uh, this area's birds. And we also have binoculars that you can take out. So please come by and check out our collection of bird ID materials too. That'd be great. Does anybody else have any questions for Gary while we're here? I just have a question about uh, Jay's. It didn't seem like there were a lot of Jays. Do we not have a lot of Jays in Rostock and Cusp? Uh, Stellar's Jays are reasonably common, although they, they're they variable depending on the time of year. Uh, now that breeding season is, is coming, they're, they've paired off and spread out. So you're not going to see the little flocks that sometimes we see in the winter. Uh, you sometimes see, you know, eight or 10 or 12 all together. Uh, you won't see that at this time of year because they're they're paired off and, and spread out into the woods. They do nest in the forest, even the coniferous forest. So, you know, you're not going to see them around town as much anymore. Uh, but the, they're around. Um, the other jay species we have are, are the Canada jay or the gray jay, which prefers uh, mid elevation. So you'd, you know, if you if you drive up Mount Rolstoke or if you drive up any of the logging roads around the Nicusp area, you run into those once you get up a little higher. And more and more in the last few years, we've been getting the odd blue jay, which is was originally or traditionally an eastern bird, east of the Rockies only. But they certainly got a toehold in the west now. Uh, there are three or four of them that live in Nicusp for the last few years. Uh, I saw one in Edgewood a month or so ago. I know that they're breeding in small numbers in Castlegar and Preston. So they, they, are, they are making inroads into the West. And I think it's probably only a matter of time before Blue Jays become reasonably common as well. Um, and I just have another question. I have a friend of mine who hates starlings and I'm not sure if it's just because of the noise. Is that sort of a common uh, aversion to that particular bird? Yep, yep. Nobody likes starlings. A <laughs> uh, couple, couple of reasons. First of all, they're non-native; they don't belong here. It's a, it's an introduced bird from Europe. And secondly, it's it's so successful that their numbers are extreme in places. Uh, you. You can see flocks, well, around the cusp, I would say a flock of four or 500 is, is about as big as they will get. There was a big flock in, in Browse about a month ago, 
and I'm, I'm assuming it was a migrating flock because there's certainly not that many around now, but there were about 400 in that flock I saw in browse. But if you go down into the Fraser Valley where they grow blueberries and all those wonderful things that starlings like to eat, um, you'll see thousands of them and they fly around in these massive flocks and they devastate the, the food, the, um, the fruit crop in places. And the third thing, the third strike against them is that they, because they're so numerous, they take over all the suitable cavity nesting sites. So things like chickadees that like to nest in cavities and all the swallows that nest in cavities, um, they're all taken by the starlings and uh, other birds are just running out of places to nest because in, in, in places where there are lots of starlings. So yeah, there's two or three strikes against them, I'm afraid. one of the very few birds in in the province that you're actually allowed to shoot you can just shoot them anytime you want Colleen did you have a question yeah I did um what's the difference how do you recognize the difference between a golden eagle and an immature um uh, uh bald, eagle? bald eagle yeah um, that's not the easiest question in the world to answer, but I'll give you some ideas. Uh, immature bald eagles, particularly in flight, now it's, it's easier in flight. An immature bald eagle will have white feathers or pale feathers kind of randomly scattered over their body, over the underside of their wings, and, and sometimes they're more white than dark. And other times they're more dark than white and it varies with age and it varies from bird to bird. Golden eagles have a very tight pattern of white feathers in one location only and that's pretty much in the middle of their wing. It's actually the base of the flight feathers uh, can be white. There'll be no white anywhere else except in their tail and their tail will be half white and half dark if it's an immature golden eagle. If it's an adult golden eagle, it will show no white at all. And golden eagles are so called because of the coloration, that sort of goldy color that they have on the back of their head. Now you can't always see that, especially if the bird's circling in the sky. Um, but even young golden eagles have that golden color on the back of their head. But if you see an eagle in flight and he's got random white scattered all over him, it's an immature bald eagle. And as I said, when we, when we were looking at that picture, um, I, to be quite honest, I'm very skeptical of all reports of golden eagles in the valley bottom in Arrow Lake. Um, I, I, I can't say never because I have seen a very small number over the years. Always immatures. I've never seen an adult golden eagle in the valley bottom. I've seen them in the alpine meadows, but I've never seen an adult golden in the valley bottom. Uh, you will in the Okanagan and you will in Creston, but um, not too many other places in, in the West Kootenai anyway. It, it, can be, it can be a bit tricky but if you see um, a brown eagle, your first assumption should be that it's an immature bald, and then look hard to see if you can see any reason why it isn't. But the default bird here is, is immature bald eagle. Thank you. Grace, I think I'm... Um... If any, unless anybody else has any burning bird questions for Gary, um, I think maybe this might be a great time to draw to a close. Anybody last last minute questions? No, no, but you just, you just um, might want to give them a plug for the the tree one. <laughs> oh yeah, don't worry, I've got more okay, coming. Great. Or soon. So yeah, I'm. Uh, we do have a tree identification workshop next Thursday at four thirty and um, look for more identification workshops in the future because we've got some other things at the works. 
So if you would like more information, feel free to email me and say, yes, please tell me more about the upcoming workshops. That would be great. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you very much, Gary. That was lovely. I always love seeing your photographs, just beautiful. And uh, I'm so glad that you, um, you obviously know a lot and can answer tons of questions. That's wonderful. Thanks very much for your time today. Oh, you're most welcome. Any, anytime anybody has any questions, I certainly don't mind phone calls or emails uh, about birds. I, I get a lot of them anyway. People send me pictures or people phone me and try and describe things. Um, and I have, I have no problem with that. You feel free to contact me anytime you want. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the phone book. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. Have a lovely day.